Hey, what's going on guys? Kurosama here. So I'm getting into something a little bit different than Gundam. I'm actually trying out a new TCG. As a lot of you probably know, I've got into TCG over the years, uh, pretty much when I was a little kid doing Pokemon, Yu-Gi-Oh, Magic the Gathering, and currently doing Digimon and a little bit more of Pokemon, but on the collectible side. So I decided, let me get into this brand new TCG that came out on April 28th of this year and just see what it's about. Now the IP of Shadowverse has been around since 2016. Now for Shadowverse, apparently it's extremely popular from what I've seen, and a lot of people that have played over the years, they're telling me it's extremely, extremely popular in the East and a little bit in the West as well. But for me, I'm just gonna be focusing on the TCG and basically teaching y'all how to play while also simultaneously teaching myself how to play. Now talking about this TCG, we're just gonna go ahead and start off with what is on the board. For the board layout, you're gonna have your leader, you're gonna have your deck area, your graveyard, your banish spot, your evolution cards, your play area, and lastly, your EX area. Now for the leader class, you're gonna have six different types in total. You're gonna have forest, sword, nightmare, rune, dragon, and haven. Now although neutral isn't a class, it is represented by its own symbol and can be put into any deck. Now the leader cards are represented by a symbol and every other card basically has that same symbol. I go with Nightmare because I like the whole aesthetic of just demons and ghosts and all that stuff. It's pretty dope, so I decided to go with that and they got this ghost chick who is amazing. I think she's cool because she's psychotic as hell. Hello there, I'm on an adventure. Do you want to be part of it? You can be the person who gets killed. I'm going to kill you now. Now for the different types of cards, there are followers, evolved followers, spells, amulets, tokens, and your evolution point cards. Let's talk about the follower cards real quick. They are basically what you use in order to attack. Followers have a play cost, and behind that play cost is going to be the class symbol. They're going to have their attack and defense, which is represented by a sword and a shield. They have their effect text, which is pretty much right over the illustration. The name of the card. They also have a trait, which is basically like dead or vampire, that is kind of a characteristic of the card, but so far what I've seen, there's not too many cards that is going to be utilizing it as of right now. And the rarity. They are gonna have an evolved follower, which is a different card altogether. The difference is this one is gonna have evolve at the bottom, and then the play cost is going to be omitted. But everything else is pretty much intact in terms of text, illustration, attack, and defense. Now spell cards are going to have a play cost, and it's also gonna be represented by the class right behind that play cost. The effect text, the illustration, and then the trait is gonna be at the bottom as well. You have amulets, and amulets are gonna have the play cost, the class right behind it, the effect text, and the traits as well as the name. Now for tokens, they are going to also have a play cost, an attack and defense if they're a follower type. They're gonna have their effects or anything of text right there in the text block, illustration, traits, but if it's a spell, it's just not gonna have the attack and defense, it's gonna be treated pretty much like a spell, but it's gonna have token right next to it. Now for evolution points, that is basically in lieu of a play point that you would normally spend for evolution, so you can use this evolution point instead of the PP. Now constructing your deck. Decks are constructed between 40 and 50 cards in that particular deck. From there, you're gonna have no more than three of a single named card. So if that card comes into a different set, but it is the same name, you can only have three of that card. You cannot have six that are from different sets. Your evolution deck is only gonna consist of zero to 10 cards. And once again, three of the same name. When setting up your mat, you're gonna place all your cards in their respective areas. So your leader's gonna go in the leader spot, your deck in the deck spot, but you're gonna to wanna to tilt that a little bit diagonally because that's how the cool kids play. And then you're gonna put your Evo cards in its little respective slot. And for your evolution points, that can go top, bottom, wherever you really want. And then for tokens, I just keep them off the play mat because I'm not trying to confuse anyone. Now there's a couple other items that you're going to want to use whenever you're starting this game. You're going to want to have a PP max and PP counter. So you could use what's on the play mat itself or use something external like a Digimon counter, for example, and use that for your PP counters. Then you're gonna want a 20 life or 20 stamina counter. The starter decks come with one that's like a little wheel 
it's fine, but I actually just like to use a die, and if I go over 20 stamina for my leader, then I just get an extra die. Now deciding who goes first is something in Japan a very easy thing to do. You just play paper, scissors, rock, whoever wins, bam, they go first. But in the states, for whatever reason, they just don't like paper, scissors, rock. I don't know why. But uh, in lieu of paper, scissors, rock, you can flip a coin or you can roll a die, which is the more traditional route. Now the player going first is going to draw four cards. Their evolution points are going to be set to zero. The second player, he's also going to draw four cards and then that person is going to have three evolution points to start off. Unfair in my opinion, but then the game rules. Now each player's PP and max PP is going to be set to zero. However, once the first player begins his turn, that max PP and PP is going to be set to one. Now there is a mulligan system, so whenever you draw your first four cards, if you don't like all four of those cards, you can place them underneath your deck and then draw a new set of four cards. You can only do this one time. Now during the start phase, if you did have followers or any kind of items that were in a act state, which is turning the cards sideways, then you would stand those cards during that start phase. After this, then you draw a card, but if you started the game first, then you do not draw a card. Next is going to be the main phase. What you can do in the main phase is pay PP in order to play a card, which is a follower or spell amulet. You can use a card's activation ability. You can also evolve a follower, which is only once per turn, or you can attack with a follower. Now for demonstration purposes, let's say our PP max and the regular PP is set to three right now. We're going to spend two PP and we're gonna reduce it right here on the mat and we're gonna summon a follower that is a two PP cost. Now for this follower, it has a fanfare ability and a fanfare ability is something that when summoned or played, it gets activated. So this one, I can put a bat in my EX area. Now, since I just played this follower, it cannot attack a follower or a leader. It is basically having summoning sickness. So to get rid of the summoning sickness, at least in a way, we can go ahead and evolve it. And if you look on the card, it has the E, which stands for evolve, and then you're gonna have the cost right next to it, which is one PP. Let's go ahead and use an evolution point, which you can use once per turn in order to evolve this card. Now we pay the EP and we can play a evolution card of the same name directly on top of it from the evolution pile. Now, since we've done an evolution this turn, we cannot do any more evolutions on any other card for the rest of the turn. Now, since we have a evolved follower that is ready to attack another follower, let's just say our opponent has an opposing follower in the act position for us to attack. Now for battling, it is basically a clash between a follower and a leader or a follower and another follower. We're gonna take our evolved follower, we're gonna put it into the act position from stand, and we're going to declare what we're attacking. Since we can only attack the other follower, that's what we're gonna do. So we declare we attack that other follower. Now my character has a clash effect. Clash being when it attacks another leader or follower, its ability activates before the actual damage calculation step. So because I declared my attack, and it will be clashing, I, as the turn player, will have the priority in the clash effect going off. But if my opponent has another ability or a quick spell, they can activate that. To my knowledge, turn player still has priority, but I've also read that it is a stackable uh, effect that's going to be in the resolution zone. For the sake of argument, let's just say my opponent doesn't activate anything, he doesn't have any effects. I attack, clash goes off, I get two health, and let's go ahead and get into damage calculation. You're going to want to subtract the attack of the opposing follower from the defense of yours, and that's gonna work simultaneously. So their attack is gonna be subtracted from my defense defense and same for them. So I take X amount of damage and then they're going to take X amount of damage. If your follower does not die, they basically just get the little counters put on it to reflect how much damage they took. If it did die, then it goes to the graveyard. However, the evolution card is going to go face up on the evolution pile and then the bottom card, the base uh, follower as you will, will go into the graveyard respectfully. Now for spells, if you have a spell, you basically pay the cost, then it gets resolved, sent to the graveyard, done. Now if a spell has a quick on it, then it can be played on your main phase or your opponent's attacking phase. So whenever they attack with their monster, you can play it or on your opponent's end phase. 
amulets, you pay the cost and you place it onto the playing field. So your playing field is going to have a limit to how much can be on it. This includes your followers, the evolved followers, the tokens, as well as amulets. And you can have a total of five of any one of those. So if you have uh, four tokens, one amulet, you can't play anything else. The same goes for your EX area. You can have a total of five cards in there at one point. Now for abilities, there's a lot and I think that that should be covered in a separate video because it is extensive and I'm seeing a lot of other how to play rules and, and other different like manuals that don't cover some of the wordage that does cover on certain cards that would have you assume what that ability does, such as Crimson. Crimson is active whenever you take damage that turn. It's mostly made for the Nightmare class, so if I take damage, like Crimson is like an invisible thing that gets active. There's no, I haven't seen a symbol or something that shows that, but there's cards that say basically, hey, it, Crimson gets activated when you take damage that turn. Then there's also Ward. Ward is basically your blocker, so whenever you take it from stand to act, you are act you're enabling the Ward ability, so your opponent can only attack cards first that have that ward. They cannot attack another follower unless they kill that ward card. Also, you can enable ward on your end phase. So if you keep it in the stand position, but then you go to end phase, then you can manually go ahead and put it into act in order to enable the ward ability. Last words is basically whenever that creature dies, its ability gets activated. For rush, rush allows you to attack followers that are in the act position, even on the first turn of summon. For Storm, Storm allows it to attack either the leader or an acted follower on the first turn of summon. Direct attack allows your follower to attack another follower regardless of their position, but it still has to adhere to the rules of summoning sickness. Drain is whenever your follower attacks a leader or another follower, you get the health of the damage inflicted. So if I attack with two to a leader, I get two stamina on my leader. Bane is whenever a creature attacks with Bane, after the damage calculation is done, the opposing creature dies regardless of how much damage it took. So for example, if I attack with a 2-1 Bane creature, but your thing has a 7-7, seven, seven, guess what? Your creature's going to die. A creature with aura means it cannot be targeted by any effects or spells, but it still can be attacked or it can be affected by AOE effects that attacks or doesn't target, but it affects the entire board. But if I say, hey, target this card, it wouldn't work. And for abilities overall, there's going to be automatic, there's going to be activated and continuous effects. Now for your EX area, that is basically just for your tokens and like a second hand of sorts. So you have cards that might put a bat in there. Then you're gonna have to pay the one cost of that bat to bring the bat into play. And guess what? That bat has summoning sickness regardless of how many turns it existed in the EX area. But it's still really good because if you wanna keep some extra tokens at bay, they won't be affected by other effects that target the main play area. So it's just kind of like a backup, which is always good. For your end phase, you're able to act all your war cards. Also for your hand, your max hand can only be seven cards. If you have eight or plus more than that, then you're gonna have to discard until you get to seven cards. Now over the course of the battle, how do you decide the winner? Well, whoever's stamina of their leader goes down to zero or the opposing player's deck decks out so they cannot draw on their next fa uh, draw phase. At that point, they lose or if their health goes down to zero. That's pretty much the way to win. But that's it for me, guys. So thank you all for watching. I'm hoping that this video taught you a little bit about this game, if anything. Uh, but if you do have any questions, concerns, or you have any corrections to this video, please let me know in the comment section below and I'll definitely pin whatever I can so that way people can be informed on any corrections that uh, were made for this video. But that's it for me. I hope you guys enjoy this. And if you do wanna see more Shadowverse Evolve content, please go ahead and give me a like up and let me know in the comment section below. But that's it for me. I'll be seeing you guys later. Bye-bye.